podcast. Hey, uh, welcome to the podcast. I am Joel here and with my dad. I am Rick. Welcome. Today, I want to talk about uh, something that I think has been was kind of mystical for me for many years, and it's the idea of what is God's will for my life. And I'll never forget the moment that it all kind of came real for me was uh, Emily and I would be married about a year, and the ministry we were running was coming to a close, and we felt like maybe we were going to be staying on the, going on the mission field uh, down to South America. And we had this oppor- opportunity in Peru that was actually quite exciting to me. Uh, but I called Dad, and I was like, Dad, I just don't know what, I just want God to, to tell me what his will is for my life. And, and, and you said, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I, I kind of remember thinking, well, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to be super spiritual. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I want. I just want God's will. And you said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I kind of think I'd like to move down to Cusco and, and work with these folks and start this cafe and church down there. And you're like, well, then do that. I was like, can you just do that? Can you just like decide, I want to do this? Okay, it's God's will for my life. So I want to talk about that. How do you know? Because I, I do believe that, that... Well, give me your thoughts on that. Well, I think uh, I've, I've found that... Um... If I'm out of the will of God, I know it. <laughs> I never have any question about whether I'm out of the will of God. And Be, explain that. Well, there's a there's a certain peace. You know, I mean, this is terrible hermeneutics. This is terrible interpretation of Scripture. But it talks about in Isaiah, they shall go out with joy, be led forth with peace. Those, of course, are the fruits of the Spirit, two of the fruits of the Spirit. And I do believe that God guides us by the, that fruit. It, you feel a certain peace. You feel a certain joy. In your case, you felt excitement and joy about going to do that. And I do believe that we are led forth with peace. We are led forth with joy. But every time I've ever been in an attitude of rebellion or out of the will of God, man, there's just something. There's a hollowness. There's an ache inside. There's a misery inside. You just It's like a guy walking along a path in a forest. As long as he's on the path, everything's okay. But when he gets off the path, he knows it by two things. He first of all starts running into brambles and bushes and sticks and twigs, and the mm-hmm. path gets much harder to follow. But second of all, it's not long until he's out there all by himself. Wait a minute, where did everybody go? You know, and it's the same way. There's a loneliness when you're out of the will of God. There's like this abandonment. God's not abandoned you, but you kind of feel this miserable inside. And I mean, it, it's like the sheepdog. The Holy Spirit's going to nip at your heels to, heels to get you back on the path. Okay, now, I don't know if we want to go there this early on, but <laughs> I've felt lonely in the will of God. Well, that's the true. dark night of the soul type, John yeah. on the cross, talking about where you're following God, and all of a sudden he literally just turns out the light almost, and you you go, did I miss something here? Yeah. Where, what do you? So I, I mean, it's it's nice when there's rainbows and unicorns in the will of God, but <laughs> what about when well, you're not, not feeling it? Yeah, they're not always rainbows and unicorns, but but I, but what that I mean is there is a um, um, well when you when you're there are those dark seasons, obviously it's but it's like. It's like the seasons, you know, the only reason we can have spring is because there's a fall. And if you don't have a freezing winter, you're going to have a whole bunch of bugs. And so we need those various seasons in our lives. There's even times of light and times of dark, you know, harvest and and, uh, sowing and harvest times. So how do you distinguish the difference between being out of God's will or being just in a dark night of the soul? Well, I've, I don't know. I've always kind of known. I mean, you kind of know if you're out of the will of God. I mean, I, okay, I say you did, and you're just saying you're not. Um but in, in with me, it's always been a matter of kind of knowing, you know, I really shouldn't have done that. I really shouldn't have been doing this. or I'm really not where I belong to be. Right. Um, because I, I think it goes back to a broader, let's, let's kind of draw back a little bit, maybe go back to 30,000 feet instead of ground level here and look at what the will of God is. Because I don't think the will of God is like they used to on the dance floors of these studios, you know, they'd put these footsteps down, number one, number two, you put number one, number two, number three. And I don't think God's will is that firm. I don't think God's will is that set and that fixed. Yeah, I believe God's will for us, I mean, it tells us some of the things, it's rejoice in the Lord always. This is, give thanks and everything for this is the will of God in Christ Christ Jesus. Jesus. There's a proverb that says, you know, that it's God's will that we be holy. It's God's will that we walk. So God's will for us is very broad in many ways. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it even has as much to do with where we are as what he's doing inside of us. And so that was like the situation with you in Peru. There were things God wanted to work out in your heart and in you. He could do that in Peru. He could do that in Acapulco. He could do that in San Antonio, Texas. Um, now, I really enjoyed him working it out in Peru. That's nice. It's nice when he can work it out in a wonderful <laughs> place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but 
it, but many people wouldn't have. You yeah, know? that's true. So um, I think in the meantime, he's accomplishing something else because hopefully yeah. you did some good for the Peruvian people as well while you were there. But as one who has sent over well over a thousand missionaries onto the mission field and as one who was a missionary myself, I'm convinced that most of what God does through missionaries is what he's shaping in their life, and the rest is just sawdust. Mm. If in the meantime he helps other people, that's awesome. You know, in the meantime, maybe you're feeding some kids, maybe you're getting the gospel out, now, maybe you're doing this. Now, that mindset is going to upset a lot of people who think that they're really, like, out there changing the world. Well, maybe they're different. but <laughs> Maybe they've already got the inside changed, and they're, they can now work on the outside. But I really think God is more concerned about what's happening inside us yeah. than what we're doing on the I outside. I remember you saying that all the time. You would always say that, Joel, whether God... You even said that, you know, if God calls you to flip burgers at McDonald's and you know you're called to do that and you're doing it the best year, God's more concerned about what he's doing in you than what you're doing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because he, he can work that out in any situation. Yeah, know? that's right. I mean, Martin Luther King said, if you're if you're called to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper to bring glory to God that there is. Don't know that we have any street sweepers anymore, but uh, you get the idea. They drive the machines, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, I don't think the will of God is something that you're going to find someday. You know, and that, that, that's another big problem we have with the will of God. First of all, we think it's like fixed, this firm thing. And if I mess up, oh, my goodness, I can never get back in the will of God again. Yeah. Which, which comes back to this line yeah. I've heard over and over again. People, and I've heard these well-meaning people say, well, you know, it talks about his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Which one are you in right now? Yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. I mean, I like to think it's his perfect will, but what if it's only his good will? Am I getting secondhand will here? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Good that's, will, secondhand. That's, that was a little joke. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a very little one. Nothing like a little joke, and that was a real little one. <laughs> Anyhow, I got it. Okay. Um, the uh, that comes from Romans twelve, as you know, you right, know Romans yeah. twelve one and two, and it, it says, um, uh, "Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God." Test first, and approve is one version that says, yeah. "You can test and approve what is this good, what is this good and acceptable and perfect will." And and yeah, I've heard the same thing. Well, now look, if you mess up, then you're no longer in His good will, but you're in His acceptable will. Well. Then if I mess up again, I'm in his perfect will, right? Because that's, that's the order. In other words, the order of that is totally out for that little theology oh, I didn't to hold. Think about that, yeah. You know. Well, unless you start at perfect, the being the highest, and then you. It doesn't work working backwards either. Then I go from perfect to acceptable to good. It oh, doesn't work either way. It's a linguistic error. It's, right? Yeah, that's right. In the in the Greek, that means. <laughs> when, when the King James's boys translated it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But the point is. I, this, this is going to blow some folks' minds too, I think, but I believe God's will can change for us. Mm. And what I mean by that is, as a dad, I have, a, I have an overarching will, as, I, as you said. You know, I, my overarching will for my kids is th- not that they would even be Christian, but that they would be passionate disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I would have been disappointed if my kids were just Christians, you know, who go through the motions and do the Christian things, you know, identify as a Christian. I want them to be passionate disciples of Jesus. Now, what they do during the day to pay the bills and all that, I don't really care. Mm. You know, as long as it's and I picked, moral. I picked that up growing up. You you were very, you were really chill about that stuff with, you know, even with grades and stuff. You were very, much more focused on being the overall yeah. arching will. Yeah. Yeah, because again, if you if you come out with a, a great education, can simply make you a, a more adept and skilled sinner. <laughs> Yeah, you know, true. man, true. I, you know, I, I'm just clever and I can really sin now without getting caught or whatever, but without being caught by the world. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so that was my big deal is my goal for you was that was the overarching goal. And I think and we know that's the overarching goal that God has for us, that we be conformed to the will of uh, to the image of Christ. Yeah. that We become like Jesus as much as possible in this life. And of course, we will be when we see him, we shall be like him. Uh, we will be like him, but in this life, as much as possible to live like Jesus and be his His extension here on the earth. So whether I'm doing that, whatever I'm doing in the meantime really doesn't matter as long as I'm being conformed to his image. And so like with you, you know, you, well, I'm going to go to Peru and be a missionary. That's awesome, Joel. Just, you know, go do that. Well, now I'm going to come back and lead adventure trips. That's awesome. My will for you just changed. I wanted you to be a great missionary in Peru, mm. but now I want you to be a great adventure trip leader and whatever comes down the road i want you to be a great author whatever god's got for you so my will now you can say well but god knows ahead of time and i'll say ah, maybe i don't know maybe he does but i still think his 
his ultimate goal is be conformed yeah. to the image of my son. Which is, that, that reminds me of something Keith Lamb told me one time, which is one of the, we mentioned him as one of the impacting voices in my yeah. life during my 20s. And he said this, I said, but man, Keith, what about that verse that said the way is narrow? And he's like, well, it is narrow. There's only one way in the door through to salvation, right. and that's through Jesus. He says, but King David says, once you get in the gate, he brought you to a wide place. It's it's like a huge, giant green field. And he's like, go out there and run and play. I'll let you know if I have any specific assignments. In the meantime, go have fun. It, it, it's like a quote from, that's, I love this from St. Augustine. He says, and this is kind of, at first you're like, what? He says, love God and do as you please. For the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the beloved. And yeah. it's basically that delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. If you really are trying with all you've got to follow the Lord, then you're doing all he's asking of you because he's going to direct you down the road. You need to get on to please him the way he needs. He wants you to, to use your life. Yeah. And on this topic of finding the will of God and Keith Lamb, <laughs> Keith Lamb also, more than any other Bible teacher in my life, affected my life as well. And I'd never seen this before in Scripture, but he talks about um, when the Scripture says um, there is a there is a way walking in it. He says, if you turn to the left, if you turn to the right, the verse in Isaiah, you hear a voice. Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Isaiah. If you, and and I never really thought of that. If you turn to the left, if you turn to the right, you hear a voice that says, "This is the way. Walk therein." Okay, so what happens if you're not turning to the left or the right? You don't hear a voice. Mm. So basically, as long as you're on the path, God may be silent. You may be in that dark time. So you just stick with the last thing he told you? Just keep going. You just keep going in the direction. The last thing he said, you keep doing that until you fulfill that. And then if you fulfill that, just wait. Wait for further directions. But in the meantime, that's what I was saying earlier. I, I believe you'll know if you're out of the will of God, because if you turn to the right, if you turn left, you will hear a voice that says, this is the way. Yeah. Walk there in it. Now, we can, obviously, we can sear our conscience and we can ignore that voice to a point that it's very dim but i believe if we're sincerely seeking the mind of the lord right and giving it time because sometimes it has to break through our emotions what we really want we're passionate about something so you kind of have to give it time to sort of pull that down which, which the people who are like i just want to know god's will they're pretty passionate about it because other people are like i want to do whatever i want anyway they're not yeah. asking god's will <laughs> Yeah, and if you if you want, I, I well, I mean, I just believe God has promised. You're my sheep; you'll hear my voice. Yeah, and He will direct. You know that that we will. Um, and so we have that promise that God is going to direct us. And and again, I don't think you can. Here, here's the other deal: it's like what we back to the good, acceptable, perfect will of God, and where I'm saying I believe it can alter for us. Okay, so somebody you, you get married and you go, oh, we're having a fight. We don't get along. I married the wrong person really? You, you really think there was like like one person out there? Mm. Because if there was one person out there for you and you married the wrong person, guess what? Two other people married the wrong person. Because the person you were supposed to marry... You messed up God's will. That's right. Not only that, but those two people <laughs> married the wrong people, which means somebody else... means the whole world is screwed up. Nobody yeah, married the right that's person. A very, that's a very closed universe. It's, it's crazy, like, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's a domino type where you're like... Butterfly no. effect. One guy messes it up, and the whole yeah. thing's... So I think way back at Cain, it got started, you know, and he married the wrong girl, and mm. boom, now we're all marrying the wrong people. So it really doesn't have any... Again, the point is, in marriage, as in everything else, it's being conformed to the image of Christ. And so you, you can find somebody that's easier for you to get along with, or you can find somebody that's harder for you to get along with. Mm. But that's why marriage is supposed to be like iron sharpens iron, Yeah, you know? The, the only way iron can sharpen iron is by rubbing up against... You take a knife and you rub it up against the whetstone and that friction. And you can find somebody that's a little smoother and not going to be as rough. Or you can find somebody that, that yeah. you get along with better or somebody that's a little rough. But but God wants to conform us. And that if you're pulling that knife away from the stone, the friction doesn't take place and the conforming doesn't take place. That is liberating. It's also a little bit stressful because... <clears throat> I mean, I, I talk to people all the time that they're like dating and they'll, I don't know, for some reason people want my opinion about the person they're dating and they'll say, what do you think? And I'll like, well, I think you could be married and be very happy, but it's going to be a really hard road initially. Yeah. So does that mean it's not God's will though that you marry them? No, but I mean, it's kind of like Paul. We, I think we already used this in a, an earlier podcast, but Paul, God, the, guy tells, uh, the guy tells Paul, if you go to Rome, you're going to get thrown in prison. Yeah. And he went to he went to Rome yeah. and he got thrown in prison. Was that was he out of God's will or was that God saying this is my will or what do you do? With That's that? a tough one because it does say that Agabus, the prophet who told him that, 
by the Holy Spirit prophesied this. Yeah. So I've he always just warned. taken it that yeah, I've always just taken it that Paul knew that's what he was supposed to do. Um, I, I've heard it also said that if Paul would have just listened to the warning of God and said being so hard headed to get back to Rome, I've heard people preach that too. Yeah, which is possible, but I have a tendency to think that he knew that's where God wanted him to go, because but it was like the Lord testing him. Say, are you willing to do this no matter what the price is? Because Agabus says. You're going to be thrown in prison, and he and all the people say, "Oh, Paul, don't go, Paul." And he says, "Look, I'm not willing to be thrown in prison. I'm willing to die. Mm. This is if I'm thrown in prison, that's a small thing." And to me, what I hear him saying is, "This is obedience to a higher call, and I'm going to do it." And and whether God is just testing that to see, are you you willing to? So the Holy Spirit would let him know, Paul. I want you to know, count the cost before you build this tower. Count the cost. Are you really willing to do this? Yeah. And to obey me. And possibly he could have said no and could have escaped, and then we wouldn't have the letters today, perhaps. I don't, who knows? So if you truly are willing to do whatever God asks, uh, then, I mean, it's, it's not heretical to say then you're in God's will. I, th- I think so. God's will is whatever. <laughs> if you're asking, I, I have always felt like if you're asking, am I in the will of God, you can be 95% sure you are. That's reassuring. If you're asking if you're in God's will, you probably are. Because you, like yeah. you said at the outset... I know when I'm not in God's will. Yeah, yeah. You're, gonna, you're gonna be pretty miserable. He has a way of getting your attention. You'll hear a voice. Yeah. This is the way, walk therein. So here's some deep question, philosophy. Uh, and I guess this depends on your theological framework. Is everything that happens God's will? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, because there are some people that would yeah, say everything, even evil is God's will. Yeah. And which, man, that makes things a lot easier to explain away. But sure. There's other verses that you're like, mm, not so yeah. sure about that. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. And I, you know, I think sometimes we can get so hung up on the sovereignty of God and his foreknowledge. And again, we feel like it's like those steps on the dance floor, that it's all this way and it's all that way. And my goodness, if I make one false step, it's all gone. Yeah. But then you get into this circular thing. You have a God knew you're going to make that false step. So he, he that's, planned ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> that's where the predestination thing gets really loopy. You get kind of, yeah. Literally. Loop. Loopy. You go in a loop. Yeah. yeah. You get real loopy. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I kind of feel like, well, okay, here we go. Sovereignty, the way I hear it defined oftentimes, what they're really talking about is capriciousness. Mm. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. I agree with that. God is sovereign and he can do what he wants. But a good sovereign abides by his own laws. Right. A good king doesn't just... He can do whatever he wants, but a good king is going to follow just laws. Well, and in sovereignty, the way I've come to think about it, I mean, I threw out this question, is that in spite of us going against... Not everything is God's will. I, you know, Obviously, sin was... Well, some would say sin was God's will. But say, yeah. it, sin happens, bad things happen, but sovereignty means he already had a plan for it before you screwed it up. Right. I look at it like this. Yeah, that's the way I would think of yeah. it. Yeah. And, and to me, this perspective of God's sovereignty is even more powerful than the fact that he's got everything under control and he's manipulating and pulling the strings and you really have no choice in the matter. To me, it's more like playing against a master chess player. Yeah. He says, okay, make your move. I'm going to pin your king. I'm going to take your queen. I'm, there's nothing you can do about it. You go ahead and make your moves. Well, yeah. But I'm going to ultimately, and I'll let you play around. Yeah. You can move your pawn, or you can move your bishop, or you can move your rook. But ultimately, my will is going to be accomplished. I'm going to, I'm going to slaughter you. And that's how you reconcile free will with sovereignty. Is like it's a closed board. Um, he's he's drawn the limits. He said that to Job. You know, where were you when I drew the limits of what is? So he he's drawn the limits. You have total freedom within those limits. And even if you do everything. He's like, he knows every possible move that can be made and right. he can outplay you, which is really reassuring. But it could also mean you just stop fighting his will because yeah. he'll crush you if he wants to. Yeah. I mean, really. But it's re- also reassuring that, man, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I made that mistake. I totally regret right. it. But you know what? You haven't outplayed the master. Exactly. Yeah. I've lost the queen. I've lost, you know, but. Well, he was going to win anyway. Yeah. He's going to win in the end. That's how his will yeah. will ultimately be accomplished. Exactly. Yeah, you, exactly. That's, a, that's a sovereignty you can buy into uh, rather than... It's almost like a blaming... I don't want, you don't want to blame everything on God or, or give him a cop-out for everything. Like, well, God is sovereign. And, yeah, but he didn't want that to happen. Right. 
um, but yet look what he created out of it. So. Well, that's where you, you go to Romans eight twenty eight, and you know, I hope, hopefully we haven't gotten too far off the will of God here because Romans eight twenty eight says, and we know, which first of all I. Not sure I always do know, but right. that's a big assumption that I know this. I may know it, but I often and forget like, it. And we remind ourselves. Yes, and we remind <laughs> ourselves that all things work together for the good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so it's not saying that everything that happens is good. It's not saying that everything that happens is his will. Mm-hmm. But it's saying that he's able to take even the bad things that happen and work those together. Yeah, and the the best example I, I love the way that God so often in nature gives us pictures of things to help us understand these spiritual truths, and the best picture I know of this is salt. You take um, sodium and chloride, right? Sodium chloride, mm-hmm. and either of those separately is poisonous. You know, if you ingest them, they'll kill you. They're they're dangerous. They're but you put them. I mean, either one is deadly, mm-hmm. but you put them together and they work together to form an essential element for life. You can't live without salt in your body. And so you've got two poisonous things that work together wow. to bring life, two deadly things that bring life when mixed together. And he's the master chemist that knows what can be, what he could even put together. I think he even put it together before we figured it out. Wow. <laughs> and so, now that is very sovereign. That's very preordained. Like He put it together before we figured it out. Oh, yeah. I believe in Yeah, Pre- those he foreknew, he predestined. So I believe in all of that. That's where it gets tricky. The, yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's so hard to ride the middle. You want to just right. go all over here, like it's all, the 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 you know, what's that, the guy up in Minnesota. Uh, I think he's in Minnesota. Greg Boyd. That he's kind of the other extreme of the Calvinist view of like, well, everything is preordained. Preordained. God is having in this. Then is the other one. Uh, is it open theism? Open theology. Open theology. Yeah, where it's like, uh, well, anything can happen. And it's it's hard to walk the line though because there's yeah. verses for both of them. Yeah. But then also you can fall into the abyss of, well, I'm, I guess it was God's will that it went down that way. No, I don't know about that because there's a lot of sin that happens that is not yeah. God's will. A lot of terrible things in this world that happen and it's not God's will. Yeah. But he's when you're omnipotent, you have the luxury of being able to orchestrate everything together yeah. for good. I mean, if he could if he could throw all the planets into orbits and they're doing all their things and all those little moving parts up there and they're not colliding and running into yeah. each other. He can certainly orchestrate our life as well. That's that's kind of what he spent the whole last half of the book of Job talking about. Is hey, right. let's, let me just remind you. He didn't even answer his question. Job's like, you know, everybody's like, why would this happen? And God's like, hold up, put on your big boy pants. Let me talk to you about some things I've put in order here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, because his ask was, was it God? You know, he's trying to figure out was it God's will that he suffered. And the interesting thing about Job, and this is what I got from that book, Disappointment with God, is. By all indications, Job was a pawn in a cosmic wager. I mean, yeah, he really was. Yeah, that's a book you don't like. What do you do with that book? Yeah, but yet, God orchestrated it all in the end for for Job, and and he just to show yeah. his power. Yeah, I know. I remember when I got to the end of that book, one, the book of Job, one time I was thinking, and it says, and he gave Job more children, he gave him more oxen and more cattle. I'm thinking, well, that's nice, but that still doesn't replace the kids that. The pain of what he lost. Yeah, I lost these kids. It's giving me more. And, and one time I was kind of murmuring to the Lord about that. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, just said, well, God, that's so what? You know, if I lost my three kids, I wouldn't care if you gave me six more. That still doesn't. And he said, I never said it made up for those three. Mm. But let me just ask you this. Do you think Job's complaining for the last thousand years? Yeah. No, eternal I guess pers- not. <laughs> you know? Eternal perspective. you got to keep that eternal perspective. Which is a huge part of God's will. If yeah. God is looking at the eternal consequences of everything goes on and we can't even we can't see next year right yeah <laughs> yeah came see them all came see yeah. an hour from now yeah so that that's what's hard though is that we don't see the eternal yeah. uh, again back to the chess player i i don't know it makes me a little nervous comparing god to a chess player but but <laughs> when you look at that like he knows seven steps 10 steps 15 steps down the road what's what's happening and we can't even see that so he knows what needs to happen to get what his ultimate purpose down the road is. And I mean, that's just a mind boggling concept with all the moving pieces in the world. Well, that's what I say. I think it, it makes him a bigger God than yeah. this puppeteer God that's controlling everything. Cause I hear people say, well, if you have the choice to do this or do that, then that means God's out of control. And I go, no, he's more in control. Mm. Do what you want to do. I'm going to still accomplish my purpose. Yeah. yeah. Which brings, again, it brings a lot of peace 
for anybody that's saying, man, I just don't know what God's will is, you know, yeah. if it's somebody you're supposed to marry or if it's a job you're supposed to take or not supposed to take. And it, just move forward, focus on the Lord as best as you can, doing the best you think you, yeah. you can. And, and, and he's going to, I love one time you talked about, uh, to me, you said, you know, it's God's, God's not trying to hide from you. He's not trying to hide his will from you. It's up to him to communicate clearly to his sheep. Right. And he'll do it. And so if you're not hearing clear communication, then just keep moving forward because you're probably in God's will. Talk yeah. about that. Like, Well, I think one of the, uh, related to that, I think one of the greatest, I uh, probably shared this story before because it ties in so well with the will of God. It has to do with a friend of ours, Bill Word, who was trying to find the mind of the Lord on something. And, you know, he went up to the church and he just for three days would just lay on the floor and cry out and sing and walk around praying. And, and like for three solid days, he was just up at the church fasting and praying. And finally, after three days of total frustration, not sensing anything from the Lord, finally he said, and he just told me, he said, I, I finally out loud cried out to the Lord, God, I don't know the first thing about following you. And for the first time in three days, he heard the Lord and he goes, that's right, Bill, you don't. You don't know the first thing about following me, but I know everything about leading you. And that, I think that summed it up so well because I feel like somehow it's up to me to find the will of God. I've got to somehow wring it out of the air and out of the heavenlies that there's this mysterious will of God up there and somehow I have to grab it and grab hold of it when really I'm the kid he's the dad it's up to the dad if he wants something done to tell the kid what he wants done mm -hmm. and then all I my responsibility as the kid is just do to the best of my ability what I'm what I understand him to do and so we have enough direction in scripture we have enough of the will of God he has shown you oh man what is, what is good? good what does the Lord require you do justly Love mercy, walk humbly. Well, okay, but that's great, but what am I going to do for a job? Well, in First Thessalonians, it says, live a quiet life. Work with your hands so that the name of God's not, not um, um, disputed, what's it called, profaned, whatever. Yeah. I can't remember what the term is there. Um, and so we've got enough. Just, just live a quiet life. Work with your hands. Just be faithful and be diligent. And if God has something else to do, you know, again, Gideon was out there just threshing wheat, just doing what he needed to do to get by for the day, you know, when God came to him. Yeah. David was out in the field just watching dad's sheep, you know. And, um, Elijah, Elisha, Elisha was out plowing, plowing in the field yeah. when Elijah found him. If you just do, I, I heard a pastor say one time, and it just really touched me, he says, when God has a big job to be done, he always looks for a man who's busy being faithful at a small one. Mm. So just go plow the field. Just go watch your father's sheep. Just go do what needs to be done. Yeah. And that way, I kind of jokingly say, what if David had felt like, I've got a, I got a call of God on my life, you know? I got to go out and do something. And so when his brothers came to find him in the field so that Samuel could anoint him, they go, we don't know where the guy is. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, he missed it. All right. Obviously, kind of silly. But the point is, be where you're supposed to be. And if God has a big job to do, he'll know where to find you. That, yeah. take, that take, takes a lot of stress off for those of us who are always trying to find God's will, that just keep doing, and, and again, a lot of times, it's you might even like what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. That, I, you know, there and times, if you don't, find something you do like. Yeah, unless, because, because he'll clearly tell you, no, I need you to stay doing this thing you don't right. like. And, but then, man, at least then you'll have the peace of knowing, I know I'm supposed to be here. Yes. So with that, with that said, it's, it's really reassuring that basically, I mean, it kind of comes back to that Augustine thing. God's will is pretty much whatever. Sometimes he'll give you a specific assignment, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. as long as you're running after him with all you've got, you're going after God's will in your life. So you love God and do as you please for the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the beloved as St. Augustine says. Right. A, um, another aspect might be that somebody would be dealing with too is, if you're not hearing anything from God, it could be that you didn't complete fully the last thing you heard. Mm. And so you do need to make sure that, okay, in other words, you can't run to second base until you've tagged first base. Right. So if you're if you're saying, well, I'm going to kind of take a shortcut and skip first base and go straight to second base, nah, the coach isn't going to wave you on to third base. you got to go back to first base. So if you haven't fully done the last thing you heard, then maybe you need to go back to first base or go back to the last time you heard from him. Yeah. And then just continue walking. Fulfill that. 
God's will is always in a process. There's a process to God's will. Right. Yeah. And so he's going to take you from place to place to place. But until you... Because there's something that's happening in that tagging first base. There's something that's being developed in your life that's going to prepare you to go to second base and to prepare you to go to third base. And so you, you fulfill what he said fully, no shortcuts, and then he's, he's ready to lead you on to other things. And that's through that process of following his will, you're being conformed to his image, which is his ultimate will. The ultimate goal, yeah. yeah. That's the home run. If you liked what you heard, please consider sharing this with a friend. For more information, visit joelmalm.com or rickmalm.com. Thanks for listening.